Therefore, tonight's examination looks at Malik al-Ashtar's biography as we seek to understand what was it in his life that allowed him to be dedicated to the message of Ahlul Bayt and also ask the question, his sons who remained after he died, what service did they give Imam al Hussein both during Karbala and after Karbala? Let's examine this and dissect the topic in complete depth. Malik from the outset was originally from the people of Yemen. There were many companions of the Holy Prophet who originated from Yemen. The majority of them did not end up meeting Rasulullah. But that Islam had spread to Yemen and many of them had come towards Islam. As in many of you would have heard of the famous companion, Uwais al-Qarani. Uwais al-Qarani had come towards the message of Islam, but without ever having met Rasulullah. He used to live in Yemen, Rasulullah used to live in Medina. He would always write letters to Rasulullah saying, Ya Rasulullah, I want to visit you. It's my wish that I could come near you. But his mother would not allow him to visit. And that's why you find the Holy Prophet himself stating when Uwais wrote to him saying, Ya Rasulullah, I am of the Muslims of Yemen, but I cannot come to visit you because my mother doesn't allow me. The Prophet saying to him, Uwais, visiting me is sunnah, whereas obedience to your mother is wajib. Your mother, if she says you can't visit me, then you cannot. You find until when Uwais did eventually come to Medina to visit the Prophet. The Prophet wasn't there. He was at the Battle of Uhud. Always asked, where is Rasulullah? They said, he's at Uhud. He said, how is he doing there? They said, his front teeth have been broken by an attack. The narration states he picked up a stone and he hit his own teeth with it to try and show some sort of love towards the Prophet. The point was that Always was seen as being one of the companions of the Prophet who had never met him. He was a companion living in Yemen, but who never got to see the Prophet. Likewise, Malik al-Ashtar. Malik is a Yemeni. He used to live in Yemen and he used to live during the time of Rasulullah. That's why historically speaking, there is a major debate about Malik and his age. In my historical analysis, I believe that Malik al-Ashtar was 10 years older than Ali ibn Abi Talib. And why do I believe this? Due to a hadith involving Aisha and Malik al-Ashtar after the Battle of Jamal. Aisha, after the Battle of Jamal, came to her nephew, Abdullah ibn Zubair. You know Zubair and Talha. Zubair had married Aisha's sister, Asma. Therefore, Zubair's son, Abdullah, was Aisha's nephew. Aisha gave Zub uh, Abdullah ibn Zubair a thousand dirhams because he managed to survive Malik al-Ashtar in one-on-one -on -one combat in the Battle of Jamal. When she met Malik after the battle, she said to him, why didn't you kill my nephew when you had the chance? He said to her, I didn't kill your nephew because I am a man who is an old sheikh now. And an old sheikh like me lets young people like him go. You find in the Arabic hadith literature, when a man describes himself as an old sheikh, he is referring to him reaching the age of 70. Hadith scientists when they examine the term old sheikh, notice that there's a parallel that anyone who describes himself as an old sheikh means that he has come towards the age of 70. Malik, therefore, if he was 70 on the day of Jamal, Ali ibn Abi Talib was 60 on the day of Jamal. And therefore, Malik was 10 years older than Amir al-Mu'mineen and 20 years younger than Rasulullah. That means that Malik had joined the religion of Islam while Rasulullah was alive. A question arises <coughs> that did Malik ever see Rasulullah? Most narrations say no. The next question that arises is when we say he is called Malik al-Ashtar. Does this mean that his family tribe were Ashtar? No. And many make this mistake. Even if you go to Wikipedia today, and Wikipedia is not always the most reliable source, you'll find that it says Malik ibn Ashtar. On Wikipedia, whoever wrote that article thought that an Ashtar is his family name. Or whoever wrote that article thought that it's his surname. Al-Ashtar means the one whose eyelid has been cut with an injury. If your eyelid has been cut and the eyelid covers one of the eyes, you are called Al-Ashtar. In Arabic history, there were four who were known as being Al-Ashtar. You had Malik who was known as being Al-Ashtar. You had Bishr bin Abdullah who was known as being Al-Ashtar. You had Al-Ashtar Al-Hammami and Al-Ashtar bin Amir. 
They were all known as being Al-Ashtar. Why? Because they had their eyelids cut on a battlefield. Malik Al-Ashtar, after Rasulullah died, and after the first Khalifa died, fought under the leadership of the second Khalifa in the Battle of Yarmouk. The Battle of Yarmouk was a battle fought against the Romans. The Romans, after they had defeated the Persians and recaptured Jerusalem, had made an intention that they want to go and attack the Islamic Empire. Because remember, the Romans used to be the most powerful empire. When Rasulullah built Islam, he managed to defeat the Romans. Now that the Romans had come back into power, they felt that the religion of Islam is only 27 years of age, as in the, the war of Yarmouk was four years after Rasulullah had passed away. The religion was therefore only 27 years of age. The Romans therefore thought that what we're going to do is we're going to attack the Muslims and we'll annihilate them. Muhammad is dead. They're going to be under a fledgling leadership. Umar ibn al-Khattab was Khalifa. And you found that they wanted to fight him in an area between Syria and Jordan known as Yarmouk. A question arises that Malik al-Ashtar, what's he doing fighting under Umar ibn al-Khattab? As in if Malik al-Ashtar is a companion of Amir al-Mu'mineen, then what's he doing fighting? Amir al-Mu'mineen finds the religion of Islam bigger than his own position. If the religion of Islam is under attack, he asks his companions to go and save the religion of Islam. You find Ali ibn Abi Talib does not get affected by petty differences. Amir al-Mu'mineen, if he finds that it's an opportunity in which he is able to defeat the opposition, you find that Amir al-Mu'mineen would ask his companions, like Malik al-Ashtar, he would say to them, go and support this particular movement. Malik al-Ashtar therefore defended Amir al-Mu'mineen. In which battle? He defended the religion of Islam in the battle of Yarmouk. And I tell you, that battle of Yarmouk was one of the bloodiest battles in Islamic history. You know why? Because the Romans had outnumbered the opposition by ten times. Hudayf al-Udwi narrates, Hudayfa narrates that in the battle of Yarmouk, my cousin was out on the battlefield. I hadn't seen him return, so I went out with some water. When I went out with some water to look for my cousin, I looked around, I saw him lying on the ground. I said to him, here, take some water. He said to me, I'm thirsty, I'm thirsty, give me the water quickly. He says that when, we, when he took the water, he heard another of the companions saying, I am even more thirsty. Please provide me with the water. So at that moment, what did he do? At that moment, he said, go and give it to my companion. When he went to that companion, he was about to give him water. That companion said, there's another companion. Give him water. When he went to that last companion, as he came to that last companion, the narration states that last companion died. He went to the one before he had died. And he went to the one before him, he had died. The Muslims on the day of Yarmouk were that united. That a Muslim would rather see himself die than another companion thirsty. You find that in that battle, Malik al-Ashtar got the name al-Ashtar. Why? Because in one-on-one -on -one combat, his, he was struck on his eyelid. When he was struck on his eyelid, the eye covered, the eyelid covered his eye. And in the Arabic language, anyone who has an eyelid covering his eye is called Al-Ashtar. That's why you find that when you read later on in this discussion about Malik's biography, when you come later on to the discussion, you find if Malik was like that with one eye, imagine if Malik had two eyes on the day of Safin. As in Malik al-Ashtar, when he fought in the battle of Yarmouk, this whole eye had been punctured with the eyelid on top. The narrations, what do they state? They state the people called him Malik al-Ashtar. Malik, the one whose eyelid covers his eye and he cannot see with it. The narration states that under the caliphate of Umar, he had been relatively quiet. Until under the caliphate of Uthman is where Malik al-Ashtar came to the fore. What do we mean? We mean that when Uthman became Khalifa, Malik, amongst others, began to notice. Because Malik was living in Kufa. He was of the Yemenis who came to live in Kufa. Malik began to notice that Uthman bin Affan is bringing back every old enemy of Rasulullah back into the Arabian Empire. Every enemy of Rasulullah who was related to Uthman was brought back into government. He saw Marwan ibn al-Hakam, who Rasulullah exiled. Who was even exiled by Abu Bakr, was exiled by Umar. Uthman brought him back as the treasure of the whole of Africa. Abdullah ibn Abi Sarh was brought back. Walid ibn Aqba was brought back. All the old enemies were brought back. You find, for example, Uthman made Walid ibn Aqba governor of Kufa. Walid ibn Aqba is the man who the Quran revealed the verse about, O you who believe, 
When an evil man comes to you with news, verify the news. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, in ja'akum fasiqum bi naba'in fatabayyanu. This verse was revealed about Al-Walid ibn Aqba. Al-Walid ibn Aqba originally was an enemy of Rasulullah. When he came to Islam, he came at the same time as Bani Mustalaq came to Islam. Bani Mustalaq was a tribe that hated Rasulullah. Walid used to hate Rasulullah. They both converted to Islam. When you convert to Islam, your old hatred in your heart is meant to go against everyone, isn't it? As in, if I convert and you convert and we didn't like each other before, when we convert, that hatred is meant to leave us. The narration states, Rasulullah, when Walid converted, he said to him, Walid, go and collect the taxes from Bani Mustalaq. Walid thought, Bani Mustalaq, I used to hate them before, and they used to hate me. But let me go and collect the taxes from them. He went to collect the taxes. They all came out to welcome him. Before they used to hate each other. Now they're brothers in the same religion. He came out to welcome them. When they came out to welcome him, as he was coming, he thought to himself, hold on, why have they come out? They probably want to kill me because they still hate me. He turned around, went back towards Medina, and he made announcements. Oh, people, I have an announcement to be made. They said, what is it? He said, the whole of Bani Mustalaq have become kafir again. Bani Mustalaq had not become kafir. They had all come out to welcome the man. But the man himself, the Quran, described him as a fasiq, an open sinner. The Quran had labeled him as a fasiq because of his behavior. And the Quran said, when an evil man comes to you with news, verify the news. As we've always said, when Imam Hassan was asked, what's the difference between truth and falsehood? Imam Hassan would always say four fingers between the ear and the eye. Whatever you hear in the ears, make sure you verify with your eyes. Too many Muslims, they hear something in their ears, but they've never seen it in their own eyes. And they take it as word. Rasulullah, as soon as he heard this, the Quran revealed to him, don't take the words of this man. This man, what he's uttering is falsehood. Would you believe Uthman when he became Khalifa? The first thing he did was he made governor of Kufa, Walid ibn Aqba. The same person who Rasulullah called a fasiq, Uthman made him governor. Malik, when he saw Uthman leading Salat al-Fajr one day, Malik al-Ashtar was praying behind him. Malik al-Ashtar, while praying behind him, Salat al-Fajr, one rak'ah finished. Second rak'ah finished. Third rak'ah. Salat al-Fajr, how many rak'ah? Two. Third rak'ah. What's he doing, this man? Third rak'ah. Then in the fourth rak'ah of Salat al-Fajr, he turned around to the whole of the jama'ah and he said, shall I continue in Salah or shall I keep going? What's your opinion? Because he was so drunk. The governor of Kufa was so drunk that he led Salat al-Fajr and made it four rak'ahs. As soon as Malik saw this, he complained to Amir al-Mu'mineen. Amir al-Mu'mineen told Uthman. He said to him, Uthman, this Malik, this Malik has told me about your governor. He's leading Salat al-Fajr drunk. Uthman, are you going to keep him there? He said, I can't do anything to him. He's my brother-in-law. And I tell you, the biggest disease in an Islamic community is nepotism. Biggest disease, without a doubt. Be it in that time or be it today. The same leadership, when there's nepotism, know that Islam is not moving forward. As soon as there's a leadership of a community or leadership of a religion where you find that the leader is only employing his relatives, then know there's a problem in the system. And especially if the system is the highest one in the school of Ahlul Bayt. Anyway, so you find that that nepotism is there without a doubt. As soon as Imam told him this, he said, I can't remove him. He's my brother-in-law. You find that when Imam said this, Uthman wasn't listening. Then Aisha came and complained to Uthman. Uthman, your brother-in-law leads Salat al-Fajr drunk. Remove him from power. He replied to her, I will never remove him. He's my brother-in-law. She replied to him, you long-bearded Jew. How dare you keep him there? You know what the irony is? When she calls him a long-bearded Jew, nobody attacks her. It's all right for her to insult Uthman. The moment anyone else questions Uthman, they are called Rafidites. Hold on, but she's calling him the long-bearded Jew. And she's the one who's insulting him. You find she said that to him until Imam would advise Uthman. Uthman wouldn't care. All of a sudden, you had revolutionaries coming from across the country, across the Arabian Empire, coming to attack Uthman. You know when they besieged the house of Uthman, do you know who helped Uthman? Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ali ibn Abi Talib is the one who sent Imam al-Hassan and Imam al-Hussein to the house of Uthman. Because they wouldn't allow Uthman to drink water. Imam said, Hassan and Hussein, go and stand outside the house and protect Uthman and offer him water. 
Then Imam went and sat with Uthman. I'm mentioning this point because the irony is coming in a few moments. Imam says to Uthman, Oh Uthman, don't listen to Marwan ibn al-Hakam. Marwan ibn al-Hakam is trouble for you. I'm telling you that if you're the leader of the Muslims, Allah will question you for your every act. Malik al ashtar has complained about you. Aisha has complained about you. Change your ways. At first he said to Imam Ali, he said, I'm very sorry. I will change my ways. As Imam Ali left the court, you found that Marwan came back in. He said to him, who was sitting with you? He said, Ali ibn Abi Talib was sitting with me. He said, what was he saying? He said, he was saying that, you know, I should be thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I should be more responsible. I shouldn't be a man of nepotism. I invite and, and only involve my in-laws into the leadership of the Islamic State. Marwan said, how dare Ali ibn Abi Talib talk like that with you? What is he, Khalifa? Ali ibn Abi Talib is just like an Arab like the rest of the Arabs. That's it. Ali ibn Abi is nothing more, nothing less. You are the Khalifa of the Muslim state. You make your own decisions and whoever doesn't like it will fight them. And within a few moments after listening to Marwan, they killed him in his own house. Because he thought he would listen to Marwan and get away with it, he was killed. Do you know what the irony later is? That they blamed Ali ibn Abi Talib as the killer of Uthman. Ali ibn Abi Talib, until today, until today, they label him as the killer of Uthman bin Affan. You find that when Uthman died, Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen became Khalifa. You find the first appointment he made, he made Malik al-Ashtar as a governor. In the area of Kufa, he wanted Malik to rule. You find Talha and Zubair coming to visit the Imam. When they come to visit him, as you know the famous story, they've come to visit him. He said, why have you come to visit me? They said, we have a private issue to discuss with you. Because they wanted to be governors. They wanted to be governors of Basra and Kufa. They came to him and they said, we have a private issue to discuss. There was a candle there. He blew it out. And he put another candle there. They said, why did you blow out the candle? He said, you've come to see me over a private issue. So I burnt out the candle which belongs to the Islamic State and put a candle which I paid for from my own money. That's justice, isn't it? I'm not going to use what the Islamic State has paid for. You got a private issue? I'll put a candle I paid for my own money. He said to them, what is it? They said, why have you put Malik al-Ashtar and the likes of his in governorship? Why have you put them in governorship? Why don't you put us in governorship? The reply was what? The reply was that Malik al-Ashtar and those alongside him, they are those who should be fit for governorship. Nobody else deserves to be there. They said, very well, we're heading towards Mecca. He said to them, why? They said, we're just going to perform Umrah. He replied to them, are you sure you're going to perform Umrah only? They said to him, yes, yes, just Umrah. He said, I know what you want to do. You want to instigate an army against me. Talha, Zubair, and Aisha, all of them went to Mecca. You found they instigated an army heading towards Basra to fight Amir al-Mu'mineen. Do you know who it was that raised the troops for Ali ibn Abi Talib in the Battle of Jamal? Who was it? It was Malik al-Ashtar. Because the people of Kufa at the beginning, they weren't ready to fight with Amir al-Mu'mineen. At the beginning, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari had still been governor. Malik reached Kufa. He said, are any of you joining Amir al-Mu'mineen to go and fight? They said, no, we're tired of fighting. He said to them, you're going to leave the man who was the successor to Rasulullah. A man who Allah praised for his achievements at Badr and Uhud and Khandaq and Khaybar and Hunayn. Do you know how many soldiers he raised from there? 18,000 soldiers he raised. 9,000 under him, 9,000 under Imam al-Hasan. They went towards Basra to fight in that battle. You find the magnanimous behavior of Ali ibn Abi Talib on the day of Jamal until today is honorable, I tell you. Because you know when Amir al-Mu'min came on that day of Jamal, it hurt him that battle. Do you know why it hurt him? In front of him, he sees Zubair, his cousin. Zubair's mother is Imam Ali's auntie. He sees Zubair, his own cousin. He says to him, Zubair, do you not remember when we were younger how much Rasulullah used to praise us for how much we served Islam? Zubair looked at him and said, yes, I do. He said, Zubair, do you not remember there was a day when Rasulullah said to you, how much do you love Ali ibn Abi Talib? And you replied, I'll give my life to Ali ibn Abi Talib. And Rasulullah said, Zubair, there'll be a day you'll leave Ali ibn Abi Talib alone. Do you remember that day? And you turn around to Rasulullah, you said to him, I'll never leave Ali ibn Abi Talib. When Zubair heard this, he ran away from the battle. He left the battle of Jamal and was killed. He came to Talha. He said, Talha, we were together at Badr, at Uhud, at Khandaq and Khaybar. Now you come and fight me over here. You know the narration states? Talha said to him, I know you are on the right. But you killed my father in the battle of Badr. Well, your father was in the opposition. 
I said, who did I kill? A Muslim or I killed a mushrik? I killed a person who was an enemy of Islam. You see how that hatred and envy remains? It remains. You killed my father, he considered an affront. Then he came to Aisha. He said to Aisha, how many times did you see Rasulullah praising me in my position? And the Quran says to you as the wife of Rasulullah, you should not leave your houses. You should be at home. You are the embodiment of being role models. You know what she replied? You are either the killer of Uthman or you know who they are. We'll kill all of you together. Ali ibn Abi Talib sent his sons to protect Uthman. How is he now the killer? You find that an all-out attack. Imam Ali said very well. Are my soldiers ready? Am Malik al-Ashtar on the right side of my army. Ammar ibn Yasser on the left side of my army. Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiya, my stepson. My son, he will be what? He will be leading the banner and I'll be at the front. But before Imam started the battle, what did he do? He asked his soldiers, are there any of you who are willing to sacrifice your life straight away? One of them said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, I am. He said, very well. Are you willing to walk out in the middle of the battlefield with the Quran in your hand? Open the Quran and say that this is our sign of peace. Let the Quran come and judge between us. One of them said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, I will do it. Imam said, oh my soldiers, if this man comes out with the Quran and they still kill him, then be a witness, I did not start the battle of Jamal. If anyone started, it's them who killed him. That man came out with the Quran right in the middle of the battle. Aisha called out, launch your arrows and kill him. And they launched their arrows in that one moment. They finished him off. Amir al-Mu'mineen looked to Malik on the right. And he looked towards Ammar on the left. Ammar ibn Yasser on that day was 92 years of age. 92. And I tell you brothers and sisters. You know when Imam was asked the question. On the beginning of that battle. He was asked an important question. He was asked this very question. How is it that Aisha and Talha and Zubair are on one side of an army. And you and Ammar and Hassan and Hussein are on the other side of the army. His lines until today are immense. He says, don't look at the personalities, then the truth. First look at the truth, then judge the personalities. Pick up the truth and judge the personalities. Am I not the one who Rasulullah praised as being the, with the truth and the truth is with me? You find that he absolutely annihilated the opposition on the day of Jamal. There was an annihilation, but Malik al-Ashtar had a major role on that day. Do you know what it was? Malik al-Ashtar had already been alongside Amir al mumin on that battle. You find that Imam knew while Aisha's carriage continues on the top of the camel, while her carriage continues, you find that that battle continues. As soon as that camel's carriage falls, then you know the battle's over. So he called Malik al -Ashtar. He said to Malik, come near me. He came near him. He said, Malik, you see the feet of the camel? He said to him, yes. He said, cut the feet of the camel. Then he called another companion. He said, you come near me. He came. He said, when she falls from the carriage, pick her up. He said to him, don't worry, I'll pick her up. Malik al-Ashtar, going through the lines at the battle of Jamal, he cut through the feet of the camel. Her carriage fell. She fell out of the carriage. That other companion held her. You know what she said? How dare you touch the body of the wife of Rasulullah. You are not mahram to me for you to touch my body. To which the man replied, I am Muhammad, the son of Abu Bakr, your brother who's holding you. There's only one person in Ali ibn Abi Talib's army who's mahram to her and that's her brother. Imam Amir al muminin could have insulted her by making someone hold her who's not mahram to her. But Ali ibn Abi Talib is above such people, I tell you. For such people to be put on the same sentence as Ali ibn Abi Talib is an insult in Islamic history, honestly. You find not only that, but Imam Amir al muminin on top of that, you know what? On top of that, he said, Aisha, I want her sent back with respect to Medina. She's the wife of Rasulullah. And the wife of Rasulullah is someone to be honored. Send her back to Medina. I want God to protect her. To which she would reply, Ali ibn Abi Talib sends me back. As you know the famous line, he sends me back with men. To which it was women who were guarding her and protecting her. You find that she was sent back with honor. And even when she's sent back, as she's leaving, she turns around to him. She says, you are the killer of the beloved ones. To which he replies, if I was the killer of the beloved ones, I would have killed your nephew and the like of him. But I've let them go. I've let them be forgiven. Let them leave. You find that that battle of Jamal was a differentiation between truth and falsehood. And I tell you until today, until today, go to any other Muslim in any other school in Islam. 
Ask them the question on the day of Jamal, whose side would you have been on? Go to any other Muslim. If you come to me, I know whose side I would have been on. There's only one man I would have been with. But if you go to any other Muslim, tell him, whose side would you have been on? Let me give you the options. Would you have been with the wife of Rasulullah? But then you'd be fighting the Khalifa of your time. And if you're with Ali ibn Abi Talib, you're fighting the lady who most of your hadiths after Abu Huraira are from her. So make your decision. And you can't stand in the middle. Why? If you stand in the middle, that means you don't trust any of them. And you don't trust any of them. That means you can't take sunnah of Rasulullah from people like this. You find that that battle, and you know until today what they say? That battle was a coincidence. It was something which happened, but it was a dissension. If that's a coincidence, then Muawiyah fighting in the year after is a coincidence. One year after Jamal, Muawiyah fights Ali. Do you know what is his excuse? Ali ibn Abi Talib killed Uthman. Baba, Ali ibn Abi Talib was nowhere near killing Uthman. But when you want to stir a myth in a community, can't you damage someone's reputation? Isn't it? You can. You spread a rumor, you'll have people dedicated to you. And I tell you, when they came towards that battle of Safin, Malik al-Ashtar's performance and dedication to Islam in that battle was twofold. Number one, with his sword. But number two, with his obedience to the Imam of his time. What do we mean? First with his sword, when they came to the battle of Safin, you know Muawiyah had control of the water. Muawiyah first had control of the water. Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen had looked around to his companions. They asked Muawiyah, can we have some water? Muawiyah said to Amr ibn al-As. He said to him, shall we give them some? Amr ibn al-As looked at him and he said, whether you give them or you don't, if Ali had the water, he would give you. Muawiyah said, but I'll never give him because it would give him an advantage. Very well. Imam Ali then looked around at his companions. He said, are you ready to win back that water? Malik al-Ashtar stood at the front. You see, when Imam says, Malik is to me like I was to Rasulullah. Every time Rasulullah needed Amir al-Mu'mineen, he'd be at the front, wouldn't he? Malik is to me like I was to Rasulullah. Whenever I need him, he's there at front. Malik al-Ashtar went. He got the water back for Ali ibn Abi Talib. Do you know when Imam Ali had control of the water? Muawiyah and his soldiers were thirsty. They turned around to Imam Ali and they said to him, can we have some of the water? Imam Ali looked around at his companions. He said to them, are you willing to give them some of the water? The companions said, never. They didn't give us any. Why should we give them? Imam said, that's not the attitude. I can't bear to see a horse thirsty, let alone a human being. Look at that man. A horse in Muawiyah's army does not deserve to be thirsty, let alone a human being. Muawiyah comes out at the front of the Battle of Safin. Imam comes out again with Malik and Ammar ibn Yasir. Ammar ibn Yasir, that was the day he died. He was 93. 93 years of age, he dedicated his life to the religion of Islam. Imam came out with Malik al-Ashtar. He came out in front of Muawiyah. I said, Muawiyah, why don't you find me one-on-one? -on -one? Don't you remember what I did to your granddad on the day of Badr? Muawiyah's mother, him. Her dad, Utbah, Ali ibn Abi Talib, on the day of Badr, was how old? Ali ibn Abi Talib was 24. He completely annihilated him in the battle of Badr. So Imam said to him, why don't you find me one-on-one? -on -one? I'll do to you what I did to your grandfather. Muawiyah would hide in the back lines. Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen looked at Malik al-Ashtar. He said, Malik, are you ready for this battle? Malik al-Ashtar said, you tell me when to begin. And we'll steamroll through the opposition. Do you know there is a hadith in that battle, which is a hadith about two soldiers who are on top form. Do you know what the hadith is? When the both of them are on their horses riding, one's looking at the other. And they're going through the opposition, one after another. And Malik, while he's fighting, he turns around to Amir al and says to him, I've killed the same number as you, you know that. And Imam turns around to him and he says to him, how do you know? He says, because, and he's going through them. He says, because whenever you kill someone, you say, Allahu Akbar, I've been counting. We're on the same number. Imam turns around to him and he's fighting. The narration states they're talking and fighting. Do you know what that double combination is? If you see any film, if they make that in Hollywood, people will say, oh my God, look at the effects. You had Ali ibn Abi Talib above all these people, honestly, on the battlefield. Imam said to him, so you've killed the same number as me? He said, yes, I have. He said to him, there's a difference between who I kill and who you kill. He said to him, what is it? He said, I see seven generations down the line of a soldier in front of me. If there's a good human being in his line, I won't kill that soldier. A good human. Not a good Muslim. If there's a good human in that line, I'll leave the soldier alone. 
because I look for humanity, nothing more. You find they were able to get through. Imam went back a bit. Malik said, leave me now. I see Muawiyah's tent within sight. Leave me alone. Imam said, then Malik, go finish him. As Malik's going towards Muawiyah, you find in Ali ibn Abi Talib's army, the people are waiting to see if victory is achieved. Muawiyah's in the tent. He turns around to Amr ibn al-As. He said, we're in trouble. Malik is approaching. What do we do? Amr ibn al-As said, you know the Qur'ans we brought with us? He said to him, yes. He said, take them all out. He said, what shall we do? He said, put these Qur'ans on the spears and let's cry out, let the Qur'an judge who's right and who's wrong. Amr ibn al-As. Yeah, what a cunning human being. Because he knows Ali ibn Abi Talib has got certain soldiers in his army who are fickle enough to accept such an argument. So as soon as the Qur'ans came out on the spears, Malik is on his way. As soon as they saw the Qur'an on the spears, O oh people, let the Qur'an judge between Ali and Muawiyah who's right. Suddenly the soldiers of Imam Ali start saying, maybe, maybe they're right. Let the Qur'an judge. Imam said, what are you talking about? You know my position in relation to the Qur'an. They said, no. Maybe we are wrong on this day. And maybe you've deceived us. And Malik al-Ashtar is a couple of rows away. And Imam says, Malik, return. And Malik al-Ashtar, when he's told to return, turns around and says, what do you mean return? I can see him within sight. They said, we swear. Ali ibn Abi Talib is saying, return. He's saying, but he's in front of me. But then he turned his horse around and he said, if Ali ibn Abi Talib says to return, then I submit to Ali ibn Abi Talib. Do you know this is more important than any of his swordman skills? I tell you. Because what is a Muslim other than one who unconditionally submits to the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, isn't it? As in you tell me, are you willing to submit to the Imam of your time in this way? If Imam now came and made you make a decision, which you may have question marks about, would you say, but because you're the Imam, I submit to you wholeheartedly? Because I tell you, there are some Muslims who don't do that. There are some Muslims, even though the religion says something to them, they say, in my own time. When I want to submit, I'll submit. At the moment, I'm not ready. But when I get ready, then I'll become religious. Malik al-Ashtar can see Muawiyah in front of him. But Malik is told by Ali ibn Abi Talib, Malik, return. And Malik returns. He tells Amir al-Mumin, Amir al-Mumin, what is it? Muawiyah is in front of me, I can finish him. He said, Malik, if we finish Muawiyah, we may even be finished by our own soldiers after we finish Muawiyah. Because our own soldiers have taken the Qur'an on the spear as being a hujjah. They're not taking me as the hujjah. And you find, he said, if Ali ibn Abi Talib says this, then I agree. When Imam returned back to Kufa, his governor in Egypt was Muhammad ibn Abu Bakr. Muhammad ibn Abu Bakr, Muawiyah asked Amr ibn al-As to lead an army of 6,000 people to go and kill. Who? To kill Muhammad ibn Abu Bakr. Do you know that army, when they went towards there, Imam Ali sent Malik al-Ashtar to go and protect Muhammad. On the way, Malik al-Ashtar stopped at a service station. They had caught Muhammad bin Abu Bakr, by the way. Do you know what they did to him? They killed Muhammad bin Abu Bakr, then they killed a donkey. They ripped open the carcass of the donkey. They put him inside. They stitched the donkey back together and they burned the donkey with him inside. And these people today, people call them Amir Muawiyah. Khalifa Muawiyah, this type of barbaric crime. You find that Malik al-Ashtar on his way to try and help Muhammad bin Abu Bakr stopped at a service station. Muawiyah and Amr ibn al-As had ordered that honey is sent to that service station. It was the only service station on the way to Egypt. They were sent. As soon as he had the honey, he knew that the poison had affected him. When he saw the poison affecting him, Amr ibn al-As narrates the famous line. Amr ibn al-As says, it's ironic how God's soldiers are made from honeybees. And you find that Malik until today, if you go to Cairo, not a distance far from Cairo, Malik al-Ashtar is buried there. On his way to becoming governor of Egypt, Imam Ali had sent with him a document that non-Muslims until today admire when it comes to Islamic government. Ranjiv Gandhi. When he became head of India, Ranjiv Gandhi used to say, whenever I have a new cabinet, the first thing I do to any cabinet member is I give him Imam Ali's letter to Malik al-Ashtar. When they asked Ranjiv Gandhi, but you have nothing to do with Ali ibn Abi Talib, you are of a different religion. 
He said, I don't need to be part of Ali ibn Abi Talib's religion to appreciate Ali ibn Abi Talib as a human being. He says, Ranjif Gandhi says, as soon as a cabinet member comes into power with us, I give him the whole document from Nahj al balagha Imam Ali's letter to Malik al ashtan And you all know very well, in 1997, Kofi Annan had accepted that Imam Ali's letter to Malik al ashtar is the greatest document of justice ever written by a human being. And in the United Nations until today, you find it written, Imam Ali's letter to Malik al ashtar the line where he says, Malik, know that the people of Egypt are of two types. They are either your brothers in faith or your equals in humanity. You think someone like Ranjif Gandhi or Kofi Annan, they're not part of our religion, are they? They're not part of our religion. But to understand Ali ibn Abi Talib, you don't need to be a Muslim. The problem is the Muslims who don't allow the world to understand Ali ibn Abi Talib. We've cocooned Ali ibn Abi Talib. Tomorrow is what? Martin Luther King Day? Tomorrow? Why isn't there an Ali ibn Abi Talib Day? Why? Why would someone who affected this much of the world have a whole day for him? Whereas a man who over 300 million human beings that Maya has no day for him whatsoever. Why? Because to us, the Ali ibn Abi Talib that we kept, we don't want to share with the world. We don't look at Ali the human. We look at Ali as the Muslim. Ali ibn Abi Talib first and foremost is the human being. Is the human being whose philosophy when he says our enemies are not the Christians and the Jews. Our enemies, our own ignorance. That's Ali ibn Abi Talib. Malik al ashtar that letter until today, you find that there are governments around the world who are still using Imam's letter. Ranjif Gandhi used it in India. You find even the king of Kuwait. Do you know in Kuwait today, there are over a hundred diwaniyas for Imam al Hussein. Diwaniya means what? Means someone, for example, in his house in the basement has a beautiful Husseiniya Imam Barga, where people can recite for Imam al Hussein. In Kuwait, there are over a hundred. Kuwait's not a Shia country. But Kuwait used the policy of Imam Ali. People are either brothers in faith or equals in humanity. You find that that letter of Imam, there are three beautiful lines in it. Number one, he says to Malik, people are either your brothers in faith or equals in humanity. Because in Egypt, the Coptic, Copts of Egypt are Christians, aren't they? The Copts. So Imam was saying that the Christian respect him. If he is worshipping in his church, let him worship in his church. Don't be offensive towards his ways. Then there's a second line. Oh Malik, forgive the people as you'd want to be forgiven by Allah. Some of us aren't forgiving people, I tell you. Some of us are not forgiving. We want to be forgiven by Allah, but we're not willing to forgive His creation. So when we come on the Day of Judgment, will Allah not turn around to us and say, Hold on, you want my forgiveness? You couldn't forgive my creation. O oh, Malik, have mercy on the people in the way you'd want Allah to have mercy on you. O oh, Malik, do not appoint the ministers who have been ministers for despotic rulers. In Iraq today, do you know what, what trouble we face? Saddam's henchmen are coming back into government. They used to be governors for Saddam. They're being brought back. Why? Because they can make the, the country a stronger country. Imam says the worst of ministers is the one who was a minister under a despotic ruler. And then Imam says, Oh Malik, don't hoard the commodities. Because the poor will not have access and the rich will monopolize. Isn't it? Did we not see in the center of monopolies in this city here? When the rich monopolize and all the commodities are in their hands, what happens to the poor? You find someone in India who can't drink water. And you find someone in New York who probably is more extravagant than anyone can come near in their life. He tells them, don't reach that level where you're hoarding the whole of the commodities of the people of Egypt. That letter until today is a letter which we need to study, which we need to spread. So that true Islamic governments are able to live by the principles of this letter. And that's why Imam al-Nahj al the praise he gives Malik al-Ashtar is phenomenal. In letter 38, when he sent him to the people of Egypt, he said... O oh people, I am sending to you Malik ibn al-Harith al-Madhaji. He is a person who when he tells you something, obey him and don't go against him. He is a sword of the swords of Allah, whose sharpness never becomes blunt and whose strike is never without effect. When he tells you to move forward, move forward. When he tells you to come back, come back because he never does anything without my consent. 
Then in letter 228 of Nahj al balagha please listen to this sermon. In this sermon, letter 228, when Malik al Ashtar dies, you know what he says? O oh Malik, and what of Malik? If Malik was a stone, he would be solid and hard. If Malik was a rock, he'd be a great rock with no parallel. Woman would be barren to give birth to a man like Malik. Malik is to me like I was to Rasulullah. That line highlighted what Malik was. And do you know what the beauty of Malik al Ashtar was? To be a great soldier is not your skills on the battlefield. But can you be humble off the battlefield? Rumi one day described Ali ibn Abi Talib in a couplet. Do you know what he said? In bravery, you are the lion of your Lord. But in generosity, who knows who you are? In bravery, you are the lion of your Lord. But in generosity, who knows who Ali ibn Abi Talib is? Ali ibn Abi Talib has no limit in his generosity. Do you know Malik al Ashtar was trained by Ali ibn Abi Talib to be like this as well? Malik al Ashtar on the battlefield, there is none who is as brave as him. Off the battlefield, none is humble. A soldier is normally arrogant on a battlefield and arrogant off the battlefield. Malik al Ashtar had that unique skill of being one who was fierce on the battlefield, but then being humble off. Do you know how? Do you know one day he's walking in the streets of Kufa, there's a man who sells dates. All that was left is the stones, isn't it? People eat dates. All that is is the stones. That person, you know what he did? He picked up all the stones. Malik was walking. And Malik used to have a, you know, like they put a scarf on people's heads. He used to put the scarf. No one would recognize him. That man picked up all the stones. He said, look, this old man's walking. Watch what I'm going to do to him. He picked up all the stones. He threw it on Malik's head. Malik touched his head. This man turned around. He was laughing with everyone. Malik then had to take off his scarf. When he took off his scarf, one of the men at the end saw him. And he came back to the man who threw the stones. He said, do you know who you just threw that at? He said, no, just some old man. He said, you threw it at the commander of Ali ibn Abi Talib's army. You know what commander of Ali ibn Abi Talib's army means? This means Ali ibn Abi Talib thinks he's as good as him on the battlefield. This person's face had turned blue. Because this person's thinking, I just threw it on this man. What's going to happen to me? He ran after. He's asking, where's Malik? Where's Malik? Where's Malik? They said he just went into the mosque to pray. When he entered, he waited for Malik to pray, finish his salah. When Malik finished his salah, he said to him, Oh, Malik, forgive me. I didn't know it was you. I was wrong with what I did. Malik said, do not worry. As soon as you hit me, I went to the mosque to ask Allah to forgive you for what you've done. See that humility? I went to the mosque to ask Allah to forgive you for what you've done. And that's why Malik al-Ashtar, when he went six feet under the ground, his memory remains six feet above the ground with the sons he left behind. Because in this life, what are we? When we leave the earth, isn't our sons our sadaqa jariya? Our sons? Don't they continue our principles? Don't they look after our message? We know we can get thawab even though we're under the ground. Every time our son reminds us of Al Muhammad. When we're above the ground, then that's bank balance increase on the day of judgment without a doubt. You find Malik al Ashtar had two sons. One called Ishaq and the other called Ibrahim. Ishaq, in my research, on the 10th of Muharram, after Habib ibn Mabahir, no one killed more of the opposition on the 10th of Muharram than Ishaq, the son of Malik al-Ashtar. And you know this Ishaq, the son of Malik al-Ashtar? Imam would look at him on the 10th of Muharram. And when he'd look at him, he'd remember that, look, Ishaq is with me like his dad was with my dad. Isn't it? Ishaq is with me, like his dad was with my dad. But he had another son who avenged Karbala, and that was Ibrahim. Ibrahim, son of Malik al-Ashtar with Mukhtar al-Thaqafi. Five years after Karbala, both of them couldn't be at Karbala. Five years after Karbala, they went after each of the killers of the 10th of Muharram. And I tell you, brothers and sisters, Mukhtar, when he was in prison, he couldn't make Karbala because he was in prison. Mukhtar, when he was in prison, while he was being hung, he called out, if I don't catch Umar ibn Sa'ad, and I don't catch Shimr ibn Dijoshan, and if I don't catch Ibn Ziyad, and if I don't catch Harmala ibn Kahil, and if I don't catch Sinan ibn Anas, then I want all of you to call me a liar. I'm going to catch them one by one. Five years after Karbala, Mukhtar caught them one by one. And you know what hurt Mukhtar? 
he didn't know exactly what they did on the 10th of Muharram. He didn't know exactly. It's the first time he heard was when he asked them each, what did you do? The first people he caught. He caught a man, he put him in the courtroom, he said, excuse me, what did you do on the 10th of Muharram? The man replied, I am the man who cut the right hand of Abu Fadl al-Abbas. Abu Fadl al-Abbas, he says, he was trying to come back having collected water. He said none of us could fight him one on one. And we knew if we killed Abbas, we killed Hussein. He said, I saw him returning. I struck his right hand from the top of the hand near the shoulder. And the whole hand in one moment fell. Then he caught a second man. He said to him, what did you do? He said, I cut the left hand of Abu Fadl al-Abbas. Then do you know he caught the third man? He caught Shimr bin al -Joshan. And Shimr bin al -Joshan, until his last moment, was so arrogant. I sat on the chest of Hussein. And I beheaded him. And I used the blunt dagger while I did it. Who did he catch after that? After that, he caught these ten horse riders. This is the saddest one, in my opinion. The ten horse riders. He asked them, he said, excuse me, who are you? They gave their names. He said, well, who's your dad? He said, we, we have never met our dad. He said, what did you do on the 10th of Muharram? Please listen to this line. They said, we didn't do anything on the 10th. We done it on the night of the 11th. He said, what did you do? They said, Hussein's body was lying on the ground. Umar ibn Sa'ad turned around to us and he looked at us and he said, Oh horse riders, get ready and ride your horses. They said to him, What do you want us to do? He said, Trample on the bodies. At this moment, when he said, Trample on the bodies, they said, Whom? First, he said, The companions of Hussein. But you know, each of these companions, Habib ibn Madahir, Muslim ibn Aws, all their tribes were in Yazid's army. So when Umar bin Sa'ad said, trample with your horses on the body, they, they came out and they said, listen, you killed our son, but leave their bodies alone. So none of the companions had a horse trample on their body. Then he said, then trample on Hussein's family. They said to him, whom? He said, trample on Abu Fadl al-Abbas's body. Abu Fadl al-Abbas, Umm al-Baneen, Shimr was her cousin. Shimr said, wait, Umar, don't trample on our son's body. You've already cut his hands. Leave him alone. Let him stay there. He said, trample on Ali al-Akbar's body. Ali al-Akbar's mother, Layla, was Muawiyah's niece and Yazid's cousin. So Yazid had ordered, if you kill Ali al-Akbar, I don't want any other embarrassment on his body. Trample on Qasim's body. Now I ask you, was there anything left of Qasim for you to trample on? But he said, trample on Qasim's body. Qasim's mother was from Banu Fizara. They were in Yazid's army. They said, Umar bin Sa'ad, you've killed our son. Don't embarrass us by trampling on his body. The next line is difficult. He said, is there any body whose mother and father's tribe are not here to protect him? They said to him, there's only one body that lies on the ground in Karbala whose mother and whose father's tribe are not here to protect him. He said, who? They said, Aba Abdullah al Hussein. His mother and his father's tribe are not here to protect him. He then said, O oh, horse riders, ride your horses and trample on the body of Aba Abdullah. Do you know Sayyidah Zainab was in the tent with the Imam? She turned around to the Imam. She said to him, my nephew, I hear something that is breaking. I don't know what it is. And he replied to her, my auntie, it is the bones of my father's body. Do you know what hadith, what it says? It says, Umar bin Sa'ad said, don't trample. Make your hooves dig deep into his chest. That's why those of you who go to Karbala, look at the distance between where he's beheaded and where he's buried. There's a distance between where Imam al Hussein is beheaded and where he's buried. Do you know why? Because the horses kicked his body about. But then for Mukhtar, Mukhtar and Ibrahim bin Malik al Ashtar, they caught Umar bin Sa'ad and then they caught Harmala bin Kahil. When they caught Harmala, Mukhtar came to Harmala. He said to him, Harmala, what did you do on the 10th of Muharram? He replied to him, On the 10th of Muharram, 
I struck seven arrows towards the army of Imam al Hussein. He said to him, from these seven arrows, how many struck their target? He said to him, four of the arrows struck their target and three of them missed. He said to him, from the four that struck their target, can you tell me who you struck? He said to him, the first arrow I struck on the right eye of Abu Fadl al-Abbas. When Abbas was on the horse, I saw that he didn't have his hands. I struck the arrow in his I, uh, normally when someone falls off the horse, uh, they fall with their hands in front of them. I saw Abbas fall with the arrow in his eye in front of him. He said to him, how about the second arrow? He said, the second arrow I struck on the nephew of Imam al Hussein. I struck it on Abdullah, the son of Imam al Hassan. He said, Hussein was lying on the ground. We were about to come and behead him. All of a sudden, this young boy ran out of the tent. His auntie Zaynab ran after him. She said to him, my nephew, where are you going? He said, I cannot bear to see my uncle alone. I can't bear to see my uncle with none to protect him. He said, they young boy sat by his uncle's body and he called out to us if you kill my uncle you have to kill me first so I struck an arrow towards that young boy he said to him how about the third arrow he said to him the third arrow is the one that hurts me until today he said to him what was the third arrow he said the third arrow I struck on the six month old baby of Abba Abidillah. he said to him when the arrow hit the baby I saw the baby flap its hands like a bird flaps its wings. He said to him, how about the fourth arrow? He said, the fourth arrow I struck on the chest of Imam al Hussein. When Imam al Hussein was lying on the ground, I saw the whiteness of the chest of Abu Abdullah. I picked up my arrow and I struck that arrow on the chest of Imam al Hussein. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Raise your hands, brothers and sisters. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise us with Muhammad and al-Muhammad. To allow us to be amongst the companions of Imam Sahib al-Asr wa zaman Allow us to be amongst those who protect his message. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the originators of this majlis. To bless them with his mercy. And to allow them to receive the intercession of Ahlul Bayt. Inshallah, the final majlis will be tomorrow at the same time. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the Surah Al-Fatiha, but before it, the loudest of your salawat.
राजा जाके थक गया बोला शे लाला के मैं में से मैं राजा जाके थक गया बोला शे लाला के कोई भी जब मुन से न रहा अल मिलना से अन्न सुरना अल मिलना से अन्न सुरना अल मिलना अकबर का लाशाले आए दरिया पे वाली घोड़ाए अकबर का लाशाले आए दरिया पे वाली घोड़ाए लाशाए पास मिला के कहा कल मिलना श्री अन्न सुरना 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 आखिर लम है जाते जाते मेरा बोला है माजा में आखिर लम है जाते जाते तेरा बोला है मजा पे बहन से मिल के कहने लगा अल मिलना से अन्न सुरना 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 बहन मदीने से जो लाई भाई वो पोशाक सजाई बहन मदीने से जो लाई भाई ने वो पोशाक सजाई लेके इजाजत शहन कहा अल मिलना से अन्न सुरना अल मिलना से अन्न सुरना अल मिलना से अन्न सुरना रोने लगी जैना बे मुझ तर सुन के सदा बैमे के दर पर रोने लगी जैना बे मुझ तर सुन के सदा बैमे के दर पर पाते हैं कर बल की ये बुखार अल मिलना से अन्न सुरना अल मिलना से Oh. 